Hi guys, we're going to start uh, talking about t-tests now that we are in module three. And to remind you of t-tests, I thought I would share something that could potentially fit into a teacup, if that counts. This is little Rodeo, an orphan from New Mexico. That's her temporary name. She's going to a foster home. So if you hear little Mews, you'll understand why, because she is very needy right now. So let's move into chapter eight uh, with a one sample T test. Um, just wanted to share and give you something fun to think about. So with T tests, um, we're gonna um, learn some specific things. So uh, first and foremost, we're going to know when we would use a T statistic instead of a Z score or the Z statistic. So um, there's different statistics uh, throughout the course that you're going to learn and um, they're used for different things. So then we're going to go ahead and learn how to um, test a hypothesis using the T, T statistic and we're going to learn how to compute effect size for uh, a T statistic. And then we're also going to learn something completely new, which is what's called a confidence interval. So um, basically, uh, a lot of the um, information is the same. It's just reframed into different ways, depending on what our need is for um, testing a hypothesis. So first and foremost, when we are going from the t-test to uh, or the z-test to a t-test i'm sorry i was trying to do two things at once um moving my picture around so you could see the cute little um picture so when we use a t-test instead of a z there's some reasons why some real foundational reasons so with a, a z-test to get that z obtained test statistic um, we have population information. We have a population variance or standard deviation plus a population mean. So um, traditionally in social behavioral science, it's actually rare that we know the variance of a population. We might have an average or a mean, but we often don't have all of the population information to um, have that variance. So we would use as a T statistic if we do not have that population variance. And, and instead we would use the sample variance to estimate the population variance. So there's some extra steps with this. And we would actually use um, what is called the estimated standard error uh, to estimate our, um, the variance that we would see in the population of spores because we don't have that um, information. So here is what um, our estimated standard error would look like. So in the Z test, if you recall, um, our denominator looked a little different. If you remember, we had SEM, the standard error of the mean. Well, that was because we actually knew um, what the standard error was because we had our population information. So now we need to estimate it. So we use this notation, S subtext M, which actually is the notation for estimated standard error. So now is what we're doing is we're using all of our sample information to estimate things. So traditionally, I always calculate through to standard deviation. So here's what our new equation would look like. So in our T obtained, our test statistic for T tests, we actually have the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, where before we had the population. So this is when we do not have that population uh, standard deviation or variance. And remember, standard deviation, it is basically the square root of variance. That's why we say variance or standard deviation, because if you have the variance, you can get the standard deviation. So an important thing uh, to think about is our degrees of freedom, because now we're really relying on our degrees of freedom since how we don't have that population variance. 
So with the T statistic, now we're going to be using the degrees of freedom much more. And actually our distributions are based on degrees of freedom. Whereas with the Z-test, there was one distribution, the unit normal distribution. So if you recall, just one distribution that was normal, and that's what we compared everything to. But now we have a distribution for every single sample size, which is every single degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is N minus one. And it's basically, you know, um, gonna resemble that sample distribution is gonna resemble the population more and more the larger the sample size is. So as you can see from this table up at the top, uh, up here, they have normal distribution. Here's at this one. Then they have a degrees of freedom of 20 is at this one. And then a degrees of freedom of five here. Well, they all probably look normal to you because they're all piling up around the middle. But the key thing to think about is if you notice the, the blue line, this is the normal distribution. As you get to the tail, it's closer and closer to the x-axis. So it really gets almost close enough to touch the x-axis, but doesn't actually touch it. Whereas these other, the less, um, the lower the sample size is, the fatter these tails are. So as you can see, a, a sample size of six, which would be a degrees of freedom of five, I mean, your tail is pretty wide. You have a big area there. So there's a lot of variability is what there is. So um, we actually um, can see that the, the variance um, as the um, degrees of freedom of the sample increases, that T distribution becomes tighter and becomes closer and closer to normal. So it's easier to find patterns when there's less variance and things are kind of tucked nicely in the middle like that. So we're going to rely heavily on degrees of freedom. So when I say rely heavily, that means we're going to be looking up our criteria using the degrees of freedom. So I'm sorry that this says Appendix B. I didn't catch that until right now. But your textbook, because you have the newest version, I think is actually Appendix C, right? So you're going to um, at the back of your textbook, you will find the T table or the T distribution, and it's table C2. So in the actual hard copy textbook, it's page 529. So we're no longer using that Z table because there is a different distribution for every single degree of freedom. So if you'll notice, now we are using T critical value. So that's our criteria. And we're gonna set it up using alpha level, our alpha level and degrees of freedom. So if you'll notice right here, we have proportion in one tell. So if I was gonna be using an alpha level 0.05, I'm gonna, and, I, and it was a one tell test, I would use this column right here. So then maybe I would have Maybe I have a sample size of 10. That means I'm gonna use degrees of freedom of nine. So here's my degrees of freedom of nine, and I'm gonna look down here and look, there's my critical value. T of critical value is 1.833. Maybe my one tell test, I, I said, oh, this scores are gonna significantly decrease. That means I'm gonna report my critical value as T critical value equals negative 1.833. So our degrees of freedom and, um, and looking at um, which alpha level and whether it's one tell or two tell. Now, if I was gonna be using the same thing but I'm using two tell, I'm gonna use this column because here it says proportion in two tells, it splits it for you. So you no longer have to split your alpha in half, it does it for you. So I'm gonna look down degrees of freedom of nine, and now it's 2.282. But in that case, it would be positive and negative. So positive, negative 
that would be my t critical value if it was a two-tailed test. So just important to be able to learn how to use those tables. Um, there will be times that you might have to estimate um, because like if you'll notice on your t table, um, it, the highest it, it goes up, you know, on the second page of the t table, you have 28, 29, 30 degrees of freedom, and then it jumps to 40, then it jumps to 60, then it jumps to 120. You just use um, whatever is closest. So if your degrees of freedom is 58, just use 60. That's, that's the best way to go about that. There's other methods that you could get a more accurate critical value, but that's, that's how, what I would suggest using. So with hypothesis testing and a t-test, it's really the same steps. It's just within those steps, it's going to differ a little. And so we always state our hypotheses first, the null and the alternative. And remember with those hypotheses, we need to have an independent variable, a dependent variable, and direction if a direction is hypothesized. Then we're gonna set the criteria, meaning we're gonna use that alpha level and find the critical value so we can find the boundaries that would like uh, be the, the points where it's significant beyond that. And then we're gonna calculate the statistics. So meaning um, our T statistic, our effect size and our confidence interval, which you will learn. And then once we get all of that information, we're gonna go ahead and make a decision um, regarding the null and we'll state our decision in APA format. So it's really the same steps. There are some critical differences though for every different test there is, there is a different format for APA. A lot of similarity, but there is some different nuances. So here's an example of a one sample t-test. So we have, according to a national collegiate report, college students spend an average of 17 hours per week studying. Now, I'm gonna just let you know, whenever you see anything like a national report or a standardized um, uh, report or anything like that, that's population information. So when it says spend an average of 17 hours is what this is, is our mu equals 17, okay? So you have a population mean. But you think that students in your local dorm study significantly more than the general population. Basically, at your dorm, you think students are gonna uh, study more than 17 hours per week. So that more is suggesting a one tell. Okay, so now we know it's a one tell test. And then you say, it says you randomly select 18 students from your dorm and ask them how much they study each week. Well, that's your sample size. So now you have an N equals 18, okay? And um, then your results for those 18 students showed an average time of 20 hours. So we have a capital M equals 20 as sums a square of 724. Okay, so you have really all the information. This did a lot of calculations for you. Instead of giving you a set of raw data scores, basically I calculated the sums of square for you. Now we're gonna use alpha 0.01. So remember this is a one tell test and we're gonna use alpha level 0.01 instead of our 0.05. So is what you're gonna do is start your hypothesis testing steps in order. So remember, step one is stating your hypothesis. It's not calculating any numbers. That's the one thing that I, I think students make the biggest mistake of in this class is the math is the part that students struggle with. So they jump right to the math because they wanna get to that. The problem is, is once you calculate that math, is sometimes what your result in the math is kind of biases you for the other steps. So if all of a sudden you see in the math an increase, um, you might kind of be biased to make your test a one-tailed test when in actuality it should be a two-tailed test. So it's really important to do the steps in order. So our first step is to state the hypotheses. 
the null on the alternative. This is an actual statement, a sentence with an independent variable, a dependent variable, and whether or not there's direction. So the number of hours that students study, so hours in a local dorm, so there's uh, basically our groups. So the local dorm and the general population is our, part of our IV and the hours of study is our dependent variable. And then here, I just say will not be significantly more. So that tells us, nope, it won't be significantly more. Okay, that's our null. Same thing, we have number of hours, our DV. Uh, we have our, our grouping, which is the IV. And we have our direction. It will be significantly more. So the number of hours. So it's very, very important that you have your both your variables, whether it's um, directional or not. So if this was not directional, I could state this as the number of hours that students study in a local dorm will not differ than the general population if that was a two-tailed test. Because then I wouldn't be stating one direction or the other. So now that we have step one complete, we can move to step two, which is setting the criteria. So remember, our level of significance is alpha equals 0.01. And our sample size was 18. And if we subtract one from 18, that means our degrees of freedom is 17. So we would look up in our textbook, you know, it, it, we would specifically look up um, 0.01 and the one tail column. So it, that top row, uh, we're gonna look up 0.01. Now be very careful because there's a huge difference between 0.01 and 0.10. A lot of students will just look at that and they'll go 0.10. Well, that means you're putting 10% in the tail. 10% is way too much, no one would ever use it, but they do put it on here, I'm sorry. So you're gonna use the 0.01. So 0.01 in one tail is the second to last column. So uh, move all the way over to the right, the second um, column from the right. And then we're gonna look at degrees of freedom 17. So if you move your eyes over 0.01 and 17, our critical value is 2.567. And that's a positive number because we're expecting an increase, right? So anything that falls in this area is significant. Any uh, test statistic that falls in that area. So now we can go ahead and start calculating our statistics. The first thing that we want to calculate is our t-test, our obtained t-test. So whenever I do calculations, I always write down the entire equation I need right up front. And then is what I often do is go, okay, this, I need this. I have this, I have this, but I need this. How do I get that? Well, I'm gonna need standard deviation divided by square root of n, but I don't have the standard deviation. So here's where I can get the standard deviation. Sum the square over degrees of freedom, take the square root. So I, it gives me kind of a map of what I need and where I need to go. So remember we gave you this sums of squares so we're gonna plug that into the numerator. Again, I'm gonna reiterate because this is a common mistake. SS is not the same thing as S squared. SS is this, sum of X squared minus the sum of X total squared over N. S squared is the sums of squares divided by n minus one, right? So just because there's an s squared doesn't mean, oh, it's two s's. I think a lot of students do that. So basically this entire equation is in this numerator. It's just everything is kind of shortened. So once you get your standard deviation, then you can plug it in to the numerator and divide by the square root of 18 and then our estimated standard error is 
Now, if you notice, I have four decimals there. And on this one, I have five decimals. My rule of thumb is keep as many decimals as possible until your final answer. So that means here is where you're gonna round to the second decimal. So if you start rounding early, like over here, like at the standard deviation, and then you round again at the estimated standard error, it's gonna throw this test statistic off. So keep as many decimals as possible. And I always say, if you can't keep them all, if you're having trouble because they're so long or something to that extent, then take the fourth decimal and round it. So that means this number right here, this standard deviation would be 6.526, oops, 60. Oops, 60. That's what that would be rounded to because that nine increases the six and everything goes zero after that. So make sure that you're rounding appropriately. Um, then at the very end, you can round to the second decimal, which is 1.95. So that's our obtained test statistic. We're not done yet because we've just only done the test statistic. We have effect size and confidence interval to do still. So now for effect size, um, Really, the effect size tells us how much the treatment um, shifted the um, scores due to the, uh, you know, just due to that independent variable, due to the treatment. So, and that's without um, the sample size involved, because there are times where maybe you have a really small sample size, so your test isn't significant. But when you check your Cohen's D, um, it's a really large Cohen's D. That tells us a lot. That means something's going on here, but maybe we just didn't have a sample size big enough to be able to find significance. We didn't have enough power. So that actually does tell us a lot. So we need to have an effect size to be able to report that in our APA results. So we're gonna use our estimated Cohen's D. So that's in terms of standard deviations, how much the scores shift above or below the population mean. There's actually a couple of different types of effect sizes that your textbook shows you how to do. You've already learned Cohen's D. So here's how we would calculate Cohen's D for this in particular. We would have our sample mean minus the population mean, just like we did before that numerator, but then we're just gonna divide by the sample standard deviation. So our Cohen's D is 0.46. That's basically telling us that um, the location that students lived uh, affected their study hours by almost half a standard deviation. That's really what that is telling us. It's something uh, very, very simplistic as in that sense. Now, another, something else that we're going to um, uh, talk about is confidence interval. Oh, before I do, really quick, your textbook um, uh, teaches you a couple of different methods for effect size, and I'm only going to focus on Cohen's D. I think you guys have enough to learn online without having to focus on multiple different types of effect size. So let's just focus on Cohen's D for, for right now. So the we are gonna calculate what's called a confidence interval. And basically this is a range of numbers that we would see um, at, that basically the, the mean of the population or what we would call the parameter, the mean of the population, we would estimate that this is the range of numbers that uh, we would see occurring within the population if the null is true, meaning if there is no significant difference. That's the estimate that we would see. So we're going to use that sample to estimate what we would see in the population. And so whenever you hear confidence interval, it's a range of numbers that estimates what we would see in the population if the null is true. So the confidence interval is actually very similar to things that you have learned in the past. So really is what we're doing is we're solving for what we would see in the population. That's why you see this mu. We're solving for this range of numbers that we would see in the population. 
So we take our sample means and then we add it to the critical T value. This is a critical T value for a two tail test multiplied to this estimated standard error. So now, for example, our last test, it was a one tail test. And if you recall, we looked it up and we got our, our critical value for a one tail test. We could not plug that into this T. Is what we would need to do is go back in the back of that textbook and find a critical value for a two tail test. Because this word right here, range, one number does not give us a range. Two numbers will give us a range, that upper boundary and the lower boundary. So always think of, of that is you're going to need two tells, that upper and the lower. Otherwise, you're only getting one number, and that does not make a range. So be very careful with that. That's a common error. And this is, again, a critical value. It's not your test statistic. It's not the obtained test statistic. So to go through kind of those steps of what you would get, think about what we're using. So we were using alpha 0.01. And is what that means is that we are in need to find a 99% confidence interval. Okay, so 99% confidence interval means nine, we could see that in the population, if the null was true, the parameters would fall within this range. We could be 99% confident that the parameters would be within a certain range. So the things that we need, it, need from the hypothesis test to obtain the information for calculating that confidence interval is our sample mean, our degrees of freedom, and our estimated standard error, as well as what our alpha level is. So if we were using an alpha level of 0.05, that would be a 95% confidence in interval. Because remember, if you um, convert the probability value, which alpha is a probability value, if you convert that to a percentage, 0.01 converts to 99% left over. So if you think of, you know, here you have a distribution, okay, and we split 1% in half, so we have half a percent here, half a percent here, and half a percent here, or 0 .0, you know, 0.50% here, that means all of this is the remainder, which is 99%. So it's the same thing if you had 0 0.05. That means the rest of it is 95%. So here's kind of the steps for getting that confidence interval. So for 99% confidence interval, we're going to use alpha 0.01. And we're always, for that confidence interval, going to use a two-tail test. So let's say originally our hypothesis was to tell we're golden then. We don't have to look up a new critical value because we already have a critical value for a two tell test. But in this case, we, we, our hypothesis was one tell. So we actually need to go back in and look up for a two tell. So yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna um, specifically um, find what would be a 99% confidence interval. So 99% confidence interval, and I'm gonna look this up really quick, 0 0.01, two tells, that means you're gonna use that, that um, the next row under proportion and two tells, and it's the farthest on the right, that 0 0.01, and degrees of freedom 17, which is 2.898, and this, I don't know why I have this, 99% corresponds to an alpha of 0.01. So I think I was just rushing and in autopilot. So that's one of the reasons I was verifying. So we have our upper critical value for the confidence interval estimate is at 2.898. And the lower critical value is at negative 2.898. So basically is what we're doing is we're saying, okay, here is number that half a percent over here. Here's a half a percent over here. And then here's, you know, 99% in the middle. 
but what value, so we have our T critical value is negative 2.898 and T critical value is 2.898 positive, but what mean in the population would fall here, okay? And what mean in the population would fall here? Those are your boundaries, the lower boundary and the upper boundary. So you should be getting two different means, and that means you should be using a two-tailed test so that you can get the lower boundary and the upper boundary. So the next step is to compute the um, confidence estimated intervals. So again, we're just gonna plug and chug our sample mean plus and minus the T critical value times the estimated standard error. So I always do first the T crit times the estimated standard error. So this is in the denominator of your T statistic. And then this is that critical value. And, and is what I do is I just drop the positive and negative because in this is the positive and negative right here. So once you calculate it, you end up with your upper boundary is 24.46, your lower boundary is 15.54. So is what we can say basically is that we're 99% confident that the population mean would fall somewhere between 15.54 and 24.46 if the null is true. Meaning if we, if there is no significance, we can be pretty confident that it's gonna fall, the, the population means would fall in between there, okay? So if we look at this, remember our population mean was 17. So here's that lower boundary, here's the upper boundary. If you notice, uh, population mean is 17 does fall in between there. So, so basically, it's another way we could say, oh yeah, we didn't find significance, right? Now we don't rely on this alone to say that we're, we're not finding significance. We don't wanna do that. Is what we wanna do is go, does this support our conclusion? So we can be 99% confident that uh, if the null is true, this is where the population mean would fall, and it does. That's what we're testing is that population mean to see if it, if it falls within those boundaries or outside of those boundaries. So if this population mean was maybe mu equals 26, it fell over here, we would be saying that we would reject the null, that the test was significant because it falls outside of the parameters that were calculated. So here uh, is another way that we're making that decision. Ultimately, this is how you should make your decision is our T obtained, T crit, and our P value related to alpha. But that, that other piece, that confidence interval is just an added way. All of these should be checks and balances for you. It, if you um, didn't find significance by looking at your critical value and your obtained test statistic, but here you found significance, you know something went wrong. So you should be like finding no significance across the board or significance across the board in all different ways. So here we could see our test statistic, T obtained was 1.95. It did not fall beyond that critical value, okay? So our original critical value, we don't compare it to the two tell, we compare it to this original one tell. So it needed to fall within this area to be significant. So this is significant, that area. All of this is not significant, okay? So it's not significant, and so we are retaining that null hypothesis. So now we can actually write our conclusion. So our APA format has to basically include our independent variable, our dependent variable, and what happened, as well as our test statistic. And so um, the key is, is that um, we did not find significance. So I, is what I do is I regurgitate my null, and then I just turn it to past tense. So the number of hours that students study in a local dorm 
was not significantly more than the general population. Now this is where your APA results change a bit. So T equals 1.95. This 1.95 is what you calculated, that test statistic. It is never your critical value. You never ever put your critical value in your APA results. Is what's in your APA results is your test statistic, what you calculated. In parentheses next to the T is your degrees of freedom. So it's T degrees of freedom equals your T value. Okay, and then it's your P related to your alpha. So in this case, P was greater than alpha, P was greater than 0.01, which was our alpha level. We used a one tail test that has to follow. And then with, and I'm sorry, this got broken, we report our effect size. And then here's the new addition for you. And 99% confidence interval is 15.54, 24.46. It's in that exact order. So if it was a 0.05, it would be 95% CI, but it was a 0.01. So 99% CI, then it's a bracket, your lower boundary, comma, upper boundary, bracket, period. It's all one sentence. So they should, it should all be included. The one question a lot of students have is, wait a minute, how do we know that P is larger than alpha or P is less than alpha? So this is a difficult concept, but you don't actually have P values now in the T table because there are too many P values for us to be able to provide those in a table since how there's a different degree of freedom for, or different distribution for every degree of freedom. So you would get, um, a p-value if you were using statistical software, but when you're hand calculating, you don't get a p-value, so you just have to put p is greater than or p is less than. So here's how we know whether p is greater than or p is less than alpha. So if our boundary is at 2.567 and we use alpha 0.01, one tell, at right here is 0.01, meaning all of this is 1%, okay? But if you notice, it gets bigger and bigger. Right down the middle here is 50th percentile, right? Yeah, so I always look at it this way. Where does your test statistic fall? So our test statistic fell like over here, right? So it wasn't like, it was a T obtained equaled 1.95. So we're gonna say it was right there, okay? So that fell to this side. If you look at this, here's our alligator mouth right here. It goes along with the distribution. If our test statistic falls on this side of this boundary, our P, is greater than, right? If it falls over here, if our test statistic fell over here, that means it's on this side and P would be less than. So just think of it in that sense. So, or it could be as simple as this. It's significant, P is less than alpha. Not significant, P is greater than alpha. But if you kind of think of it as that, that tip of that um, greater than less than sign, if that tip is, is pointing at the tail and, you're, and it basically ends at that boundary, think of it ending at the boundary, that means that um, your P value, is gonna be relative to where your test statistic falls. So if your test statistic falls over here, the P is over here. If the test statistic falls over here, the P is over here. So kind of think of it that way. Uh, hopefully that helps or it just confused you more. And if that's the case, then uh, come see me during my office hours and I'll try to present it in a different way that maybe um, will help you a little bit better. But uh, one thing to think about is,
as you get into this tail over here, the, the size of it is smaller and smaller and smaller. So if your test statistic, if your obtained T falls over there, you know it's, it's smaller because there's a smaller area, there's a smaller proportion over there than your alpha because your alpha is right at that line, that boundary. But if it's over in that larger area, then it's closer to that 50th percentile, which is down the middle. So your p-value is gonna be larger than your alpha. So hopefully that does help. It, it is a difficult concept, but um, going to be repeated throughout the semester for you to uh, need to understand it. So um, just to, to refresh, um, when you're reporting your test, your um, results for t-tests in APA, you need to have the the value of the test statistic. So your t-test statistic, your degrees of freedom, your p-value, or at least whether p is greater than or less than your alpha level, effect size, confidence interval. So you do also need your alpha level and number of tails. So there's, um, so one tail or two tail. So there's lots of things that you need to make sure that you're including within your APA results. So hopefully that helped you um, to understand where we're going with t-tests. And specifically, this is called a one sample t-test because there is one sample, okay? Uh, just one that you're comparing to a population mean. So one sample compared to a population mean. So with this being said, if you would like some extra credit, go back and use this original um, hypothesis that we just went through, this, and convert it to a hypothesis that would be two-tailed. That means Starting from step one, I want you to state hypotheses as if they were two-tailed and go through the steps and report your APA results as a two-tailed test at 0.01 alpha level for extra credit. If you um, go through those steps, write up that APA result for me and email it to me. You can get some extra credit. Thank you.